meeting is being recorded. Well, hello, my name's Tone Lanzalo, and I'd like to welcome you to the Climate Justice Series. Um, this is part of the worldwide teaching on climate and justice that is being hosted by Bard College's graduate programs in sustainability. Um, as part of our forum, we were searching for four authors, four writers that we thought had a very important message or voice to contribute to the conversation about the climate change or climate crisis. And today I'm very happy to welcome Robert Jensen. Robert is the co-author of a book entitled An Inconvenient Apocalypse, Environmental Collapse, Climate Crisis, and the Fate of Humanity. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so welcome, Robert. Really great to have you with us today. Well, thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, I was born and raised in North Dakota, did a lot of my schooling in Minnesota. So any chance I can get close to Minnesota, even if it's virtually, I take it. Uh, I, I, miss, I miss your state up there. So greetings from Northern New Mexico, uh, my adopted state, which I love also. Uh, I'm up here in the mountains uh, outside of Taos, New Mexico, uh, where I retired uh, after a career at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, and keeping with the sort of biographical, I thought I would introduce um, the ideas that I'll talk about from this book, An Inconvenient Apocalypse, by talking about my co-author, Wes Jackson, who happens to be a lot smarter than me and a lot more interesting. So I'll focus on Wes. Um, I often describe Wes as the most important environmentalist that most people have never heard of. Uh, Wes is 86 years old. He lives in Salina, Kansas. And he has um, played a major role in two important movements. First, the environmental education movement. He chaired one of the first environmental studies departments in the country in the early 1970s at Cal State Sacramento. He edited a textbook called Man in the Environment. The title you can you know, sort of date there, it goes back a ways. Um, uh, an important anthology that was used in a lot of early environmental studies programs. And after a few years of that, uh, Wes being uh, the kind of restless person that he is, decided that traditional university teaching really wasn't going to be his future. And he and his wife at the time uh, moved to Kansas, moved to Salina, Kansas, where Wes and Dana Jackson had grown up. And they founded something called the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas in 1976. Uh, the Land Institute was originally designed as an alternative school. For those of us old, old enough to remember the, the late 60s, the 70s, there were lots of radical ideas about how to change the system. And that included a lot of radical ideas about education. And Wes's idea that was that students should spend about half their time studying in the traditional way, reading books and talking, and about half the time out in the field, learning with their hands. And that was the origin of the Land Institute, started with, I think, a half a dozen students one year in 1976. Over time, the Land Institute has become more known as a sustainable research center, sustainable ag research center. And that's Wes's role in another important movement the shift from industrial to a focus on sustainable agriculture. The specific project Wes undertook is what he calls natural systems agriculture. And that means a shift from annual grain crops, wheat, rice, corn, the grains that form the basis of the human diet, a shift from annual crops, which have to be planted every year, which means plowing, which means soil erosion, soil degradation, to perennial crops. And Wes asked a simple question, why can't we have perennial grain crops, which will reduce the need for plowing? He also asked the question, how do we move from monocultures to crops grown in mixtures, polycultures? And that's natural systems and agriculture. The focus so far has been mainly on plant breeding to bring perennial grains to market. And there's a long story behind that. They've had success with a wheat-like grain they call Kernza which is now in commercial production in the US and perennial rice in China through a project that the Land Institute collaborates with scientists there. Perennial rice in China is also 
taking off. So that's Wes Jackson. Um, he's a distinctive thinker. He's one of those wild, crazy, creative minds. And we make a great team because I'm not very creative. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of a plodding boy from North Dakota who's well organized. And so Wes and I are a great team. Um, I was reading Wes Jackson's work long before I ever met him. A friend of mine handed me one of Wes's books in 1988 and said, if we're gonna be friends, you need to read this uh, because he thought Wes's thinking was so important. Uh, that book was called New Roots for Agriculture and it launched that natural systems agriculture project. Um, so I read Wes for about 20 years and he really helped me form what we would call an ecological worldview. Uh, after I was uh, heading toward retirement at the university and Wes was winding down at the Land Institute, uh, I had a chance to meet him, to participate in a, a conference with him. And uh, we started thinking about collaborating. Uh, that led to a book uh, called The Restless and Relentless Mind of Wes Jackson. Uh, that's the official title. The working title in my head is Wes Jackson's Greatest Hits because Wes has an incredible gift for storytelling and for the aphorism, that kind of you know phrase or sentence that really sums up an idea very quickly. And uh, I kept a running list of all of Wes's best aphorisms and finally wrote a book that put them together and tried to explain them for a, a lay audience. And so that was uh, the first project we worked on together. Uh, one of those aphorisms I always loved about Wes, which reflects his creative thinking, is he, he's always said, we need to feature questions that go beyond the available answers. And for anybody who spent any time in a university, you know that that's a radical idea because most academics, you know, only ask questions they think they can answer because that's how you get promotion and tenure and grants is to, you know, ask questions you can answer. But Wes always was looking for um, that space in which we were beyond what we thought we knew. And that really, um, I think, underlies an inconvenient apocalypse. I always have to remember the subtitle, Environmental Collapse, Climate Crisis, and the Fate of Humanity. Um, so I, I want to introduce the book real briefly by explaining that was not our working title. Uh, the working title that Wes and I used for the book was the old future is gone. And let me explain that. First of all, the phrase, the old future is gone, we stole from a song by a, a guy named John Gorka, uh, a great singer songwriter who lives just north of the Twin Cities. He's, he's a fellow Minnesotan for you. Uh, and John has been a longtime favorite of mine. And by the old future is gone, we mean the future that Wes and I grew up with is not, no longer the future we can assume. That future we grew up with, what we were told as kids and, and young adults was, there's always gonna be more. It's a, it's a, a world of endless bounty, right? expansion, more people, more stuff, more happiness, everybody's gonna be better. Now we were told we have to solve the problems of inequity and in the distribution of wealth and power. We had to make sure the whole world was fed. But if you think back, if you're old enough, uh, I'm 64, that future really was one of an assumption of expansion, right? And the, the task for human beings was to manage that expansion in a fair and just manner, all right? Well, that future, Wes and I would say, is gone. We are no longer going to be dealing with a future of endless expansion. We're going to be dealing with a future of permanent contraction, that the ecological consequences of the last 10,000 years of human expansion, starting with the invention of agriculture up to the industrial revolution in the fossil fuel era, that expansion is over. And we're going to have to start learning what it means to contract. Uh, so right away, you can see that the book is going to feature questions that go beyond the available answers because no one has an, a real good plan for how we're going to manage this. right? And because no one has a real good plan, I want to highlight what may be my favorite sentence in the book. And that is uh, the, the reminder that the moral high ground is a dangerous place to stand 
even when it's warranted. And what we mean by that is that, you know, in, in this world, there are some people who take positions that are, uh, we would argue, morally superior to other positions. I think we all understand there's moral and immoral acts we can engage in. But the moral high ground, the belief that you're right in your analysis and you are morally superior in your actions is a dangerous place to stand when we're dealing with questions that go beyond the available answers. And it, it might just be that I'm getting old and getting cranky, but uh, I'm increasingly impatient with people who claim the moral high ground. Again, it, it doesn't mean I don't think we you know, should stop making moral judgments of our own actions and of others. That's part of being human and living in a community. But that assumption of righteousness, self-righteousness, I think is especially dangerous today when we are facing those questions that no one really knows how to answer. Um, well, what kind of questions are we talking about? Well, here I'm gonna focus on one particular chapter in the book and then we can come back to talk more about others if you like. But it's the question that, we, or the chapter that Wes and I call Four Hard Questions. So what are the four hard questions? They are size, scale, scope, and speed. I'll go over those again and, and talk about them in more detail. Size, scale, scope, and speed. Four hard questions that nobody has good answers to. Let's start with the first one, size, and I'll spend the most time talking about this. It's a simple question. What is the sustainable size of the human population at what level of consumption, right? In other words, how many human beings can there be on this planet consuming at a particular level that can be sustainable into the indefinite future? All right, that's a hard question. It's a question that a lot of people won't even ask. Um, I come from the political left. Uh, anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, uh, including critiques of racism and sexism. I'm, I'm kind of a standard lefty in that way. And I find that a lot of my friends on the left will not engage the question of what is the sustainable size of a human population. And I think there are some reasons for that. One is that some of the conversation about population growth, the problem that's usually labeled the overpopulation problem, has been um, carried on by people I don't have much in common with. Uh, there's a lot of, for instance, racism in the history of the discussion of population, where white European and European derived folks uh, point the finger at population growth in the developing world, for instance. There's an ugly history of eugenics. The population movement in the US has often been anti-immigrant, right? So, there are reasons people don't want to get too close to the population question, but the fact that some ugly people have talked about population control in the past doesn't mean the question is irrelevant. And, and Wes and I think it's very relevant. Right? And of course, another reason this is hard is because it's not a question of raw numbers of people, it's a question of what level of consumption. Now we start by recognizing, of course, that that consumption today is not equitably distributed in the world, that some people consume far too much and some people have far too little. That's a given, right? That we need to change the distribution of wealth and power, not only worldwide, but within our own society. But that said, at some point, we're gonna have to talk about the, the aggregate consumption of the human species and what is sustainable. Now, here's the last reason I think people don't like to talk about it is nobody knows how to get to a sustainable level of population and consumption. There are currently 8 billion people on this planet consuming at an aggregate level. Again, the, 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 not, not the consumption of individuals, but the aggregate consumption of the species, right? That I think is quite clearly unsustainable, right? That 8 billion um, we're kind of used to because we, we've lived in recent years with such large numbers, but Let's remind ourselves of how explosive that growth has been. I always use my father as an example because he happened to have been born in 1927. 
And the world population in 1927 was 2 billion people. In the middle of my father's life, the world population had grown to 4 billion. It had doubled in his uh, the first half of his life. By the time my father died last year, the world population had hit 8 billion. That means in one person's lifetime, you know, basically three human generations, the world population had doubled and doubled again, which is unprecedented to a degree that's hard to kind of wrap our heads around, I think. All right. And of course, we know it's not just the number of people, but the explosion of consumption, especially of that energy that comes from the incredibly dense energy, the dense carbon of coal, oil and gas. All right. So what is the sustainable level of a human population? How many people can the earth sustain? I have no idea and nobody else does either. There's no way to make a prediction to, to, to run an algorithm and answer that question. But if you read uh, the ecologists, the scientists who I think take a responsible view of this and are willing to look at the data, the, the number I hear most often from people I trust, uh, just to give you one example, the ecologist William Rees, uh, Canadian academic, R-E-E-S. Uh, Bill Rees is the, the fellow who helped uh, develop the concept of the ecological footprint. Bill has been doing good work for decades on this, and Bill says he thinks 2 billion, that eventually if we reach a, a level of hum 2 billion people, we might be able to sustain human societies, right? But it doesn't really matter if it's 2 billion, 3 billion, 4 billion. What's clear is it's not 8 billion and it's not the current level of aggregate consumption, right? And the reason this question is so hard is because no one has a plan to get from, let's say just for purposes of discussion, from 8 billion people consuming at the current aggregate level to 4 billion people consuming at a sustainable level. I don't know how to do that. West doesn't know how to do that. Nobody on this call knows how to do that. Nobody in the world knows how to do that. It is a question that goes beyond the available answers. But the fact that we don't have a good answer for it doesn't mean it's not relevant to how we start thinking about the human experiment on this planet. So Wes and I sum up the goal there uh, uh, in terms of population and consumption as simply fewer and less, fewer people consuming less energy, less material resources overall. If you were to reduce our book to a bumper sticker, that would be it, fewer and less, right? Well, that's the first of the four hard questions. Uh, let me just briefly talk about the other three and then I'll shut up and we can start a conversation. Uh, the second hard question is scale. And by that, we mean what is the appropriate scale of a human community, of human political organizations, right? And here, it's important to think about our evolutionary history. Remember that human beings for about 95% of our evolutionary history as a species, and about 99% of our evolutionary history as a genus, we lived in small foraging economies, band level societies, usually 25, no more than 50, 100 at the top, right? Mobile, typically fairly mobile, all right? In other words, we evolved in human communities that were maybe 25 to 50 people. We now live in human communities, of course, on a, a very different scale. The United States has 330 million people. I learned today Duluth has about 80 or 90,000 people. Even the small city of Taos, New Mexico, near where I live has 6,500 people. All of those are, are much larger scale societies than we evolved in, right? And it's a reasonable question. What is the appropriate scale of a human community? I don't think it takes a lot to look at a nation state of 330 million people like the United States and say it doesn't work very well. Not because this leader or that leader or this party or that party is particularly stupid or corrupt, there's lots of stupid and corrupt leaders and parties, of course. But we have to ask, is, is for instance, meaningful democracy possible in a nation of 300 mil, 330 million people? Right? These are questions that, again, nobody has specific answers for. But we know that systems at that level are very hard to manage. And so 
we're going to have to ask not only what size of a human population can the earth sustain, but what scale of human communities can we operate in in a way that's consistent with our own values? Third question, scope. This goes back to work Wes has been doing for a long time uh, on the problems of technology and the unintended consequences of high energy, high technology. This is what Wes has long called the problem of technological fundamentalism. The belief that we can solve whatever problems we have through high energy, high technology. And if that high energy, high technology creates new problems, you know, like global warming or the ozone hole, everything can be fixed by more high energy, high technology. Right? And Wes asked a simple question for a long time. What's the scope of human competence to manage the technology that we create. Right, you know, human beings are pretty clever. I'm not that smart myself, but the collective intelligence of the human species is pretty impressive. Right? We can invent all sorts of things, but what history teaches us is we cannot control the consequences of what we're clever enough to invent. And at least to date, we haven't had the wisdom to constrain our cleverness. Right? So what is the scope of human competence to manage these technologies? Well, we're seeing that break down all over the place. And the question is, are we going to take that seriously and start to look for solutions to problems that aren't technological in nature? Or are we going to, you know, continue to double down on the thing that has gotten us in so much trouble? Okay, size, scale, scope, speed. Let me finish off just by talking about speed. And that's a simple question. How fast do human societies have to change if we are going to achieve a sustainable level of human population and consumption in societies of the appropriate scale with a recognition of the limited scope of our competence? How fast do we have to change? Well, here the answer is pretty clear. We have to change a lot faster than we are willing to do so to date. And I think we have to confront the fact that we probably have to change faster than we are capable of. Now, human beings are, are we're a pliable people. We can change quickly. Uh, but when we're talking about the kind of change that's necessary here, uh, it's unlikely that such change can happen in the time frame available to us. Right. All right. So you can see why we call these the four hard questions. Uh, one conclusion might be we are doomed. Go out and, you know, get liquored up and and party till it's over. But uh, neither Wes nor I are the, the, the type to get liquored up and party. <laughs> I'm from North Dakota. He's from Nebraska. We're actually very boring people. We don't want to party. Uh, the question is, what do we do? And Sometimes people say, well, you're all doom and gloom and you don't have any solutions. And I say, no, I'm not doom and gloom. Uh, I get up every morning, glad to be alive, looking forward to the joy that's possible in my life. Um, I, I'm not doom and gloom at all. And I don't believe that nothing can be done. I'm talking about the need to recalibrate what we believe to be solutions. And the last section of the book talks a bit about what we might focus on if we no longer think we can continue the existing system in anything like its current form. Uh, the book is a little shy on, you know, grand solutions, as I've already pointed out, uh, but there are things that can be done. And in fact, Wes is doing new writing uh, about what he calls living in the downpowering. That is, if human societies are going to have to start to, to learn to live with less, that if the key term in the future of, of human society is limits, limits that we agree to collectively. You know, it can't just be one person or a few people deciding to change to limit their consumption. These are going to have to be limits that are collectively agreed on and collectively imposed. And to do that, we have to, you know, think about what that life would look like. And here I'll just point to what Wes has talked about and is now doing some writing about. As a child of the Depression, uh, Wes is currently 86, born in the middle of the Great Depression, uh, who grew up on a small farm that, uh, when he was born, was largely uh, 
kind of a, a 19th century farm in operation. You know, they had not yet gotten tractors. Fossil fuels weren't the most important thing on the farm. Uh, Wes's father farmed with horses and mules. Uh, so Wes grew up in a, a world defined by limits, both the limits of an economic system that was in crisis and the limits of a kind of pre-fossil fuel dominated world. And uh, Wes has done a lot of thinking and a lot of living about how that kind of life can be meaningful, can be sustainable, and can even be joyful. Uh, so to say that we can't keep the existing system afloat forever doesn't mean there's nothing to be done. It means we need to recalibrate what we, we think will contribute to the long-term project of a sustainable human presence on the planet. Um, I think uh, I've talked long enough, uh, and so that's a, a quick summary of what we try and do in the book. And uh, why don't I I stop there, and uh, we can open it up to questions and conversations. I'm happy to answer questions, but I'm also always, frankly, more interested in what other people have to say. I've heard myself talk for too long, so um, the floor is open. Tone, I'll let you handle that. Sure. Um, I just have a couple of questions to um, begin the conversation. In part of your book, you talked about three things that intrigued me and that uh, was, I think, um, a request for more space, more public space, mm -hmm. a look exploring new skills that we'll need, and storytelling. Yeah. And could you share a few things about those three themes? Yeah. That, that gets to what when Wes and I start thinking about the future. Again, we don't have a, you know, a three ring binder to take off the shelf to hand you to say, this is how thou shall live. But we started to think about, well, what, what are we gonna need to do different than we do today? And that's where those three, that list of three skills, spaces and stories comes from. Uh, I'm particularly fond of alliterative lists of three. I believe that all the world can be explained through lists of three, preferably all starting with the same letter. Um, so that's that's my uh, my my bias in constructing lists. So let's talk about them real quickly. Skills. Uh, if we are going to live in a low energy world, not a high energy, high technology world, there's a whole lot of skills people are going to need that most of us don't have today. Now, obviously, there are lots of places in the world where people do live with low energy, right? So. Wes and I are focused mostly on our audience, which is people in the affluent world. Uh, and a lot of us, and I would put myself in this category, uh, I was born in 1958. Uh, I was born in town. Uh, I basically, if you left me on my own to survive, would last about 23 minutes before I was dead. I, I can't grow food. <laughs> I don't, I can't hunt. There's a whole lot of things I can't do. Well, not everybody has to do everything. In a, in a good community, people, can develop different kinds of skills. But a whole lot of us are going to have to learn skills we currently don't have. Uh, I've been a, really aware of this after moving to this rural area in New Mexico, where we have a small orchard and um, we, we work with an irrigation system, a very interesting flood irrigation system from this part of the world called the Asakia system. Uh, and I've had to get a lot better with tools. Uh, I've had to learn how to dig a ditch. I was surprised digging a ditch isn't as simple as one might think. Uh, I've had to learn how water moves across a field when you're irrigating your, your fruit trees. Uh, I've had to learn how to work cooperatively with people in communal projects on this ditch system. Uh, I'm slowly getting a lot better at fixing things around the house that when I lived in a city, I would have called a tradesperson to do. I still you, you don't want to get near me if I got a circular saw in my hands. It's not safe. But these, these are the kinds of things. Now, again, it's been interesting to work with Wes because he grew up in that low energy world. He grew up learning how to do things. Uh, and, and so you see a lot of people, especially young people, trying to learn these skills. Um, an interest in permaculture, an interest in home canning, all sorts of things are exploding all over the place. And so we think low energy skills are especially important. Uh, well, what about spaces? Well, you know, I'm glad we can talk on online like this through Zoom technology. 
but in a low energy world, we're not going to be online. And a whole lot of meeting takes place online right now, even before the pandemic. It takes place in, in very kind of bureaucratic settings, right? Uh, it takes place in large institutions. But if in the future we are going to scale down to smaller communities, we're going to have to have spaces to come together that don't necessarily exist today. Uh, Wes and I point to the most obvious example of successful spaces for bringing people together, and that's churches, mosques, synagogues. It doesn't matter whether you're religious or not. We're not using it in a theological way. But to point out that you know, churches are really quite amazing spaces. People know where they are. They know when, when to come every week. Uh, when they get there, they know what's going what's gonna to happen. And so those kind of community spaces, which have atrophied to a large degree in the high energy world, are going to have to be reconstituted. And so skills and spaces are important. Stories are also important. Um, you know, um, we are a, a storytelling species. And the way we come to understand ourselves is largely through stories. Yes, we learn things in books and we go to science class and we know a whole lot of things through that more rational, logical component of our, our uh, cognitive abilities. But we also constitute ourselves through stories. And if you look at the stories that are told in the contemporary United States, who are the heroes? Well, you know, rich people and sports figures and Hollywood actors and actresses, you know, it, we tell certain stories about what it means to be a successful human being in the world today. And those stories are not going to be worth much in a low energy down powering world, in a world where we live at a smaller scale. Right? No offense to Brad Pitt, but I think in the human future, nobody should really care much about what Brad Pitt is up to these days. Right? So we have to tell different kinds of stories. And so that's a it's, it's not a blueprint for a you know, new society, but it, to me, it helps us think about in the, in the here and now, what do we wanna work on? Do we wanna work on developing skills, teaching skills, learning to use new uh, tools in new ways? Well, some of us might, so that's a good thing to work on. Do we wanna start creating those community spaces which have atrophied? Not a bad idea. And for those who are more creative and good storytellers, it's it's a good thing to do that. I happen to live with a singer songwriter and I get to up close watch uh, the amazing process by which people create stories in, in her case through song and how powerful they can be for people, how people relate to the songs my wife writes. So skills, spaces and stories, that was a much longer answer than I intended. So no. I promise the next one will be shorter. Um. Yeah, I'm always interested with people like yourself who write and work around climate change, the climate crisis, because I know it can be very difficult and challenging. Um, is there anyone or anything that inspires or motivates you uh, through your work and your writings around the climate? Yeah, well, here uh, I would point to the people I know personally. Um, you know, I have no problem um, you know, endorsing and celebrating the work of famous people, you know, writers I've never met. But I, I think I get most of my inspiration from the people I know. And I've talked at length now about one of those people who is Wes. Uh, Wes inspires me. And part of the way he inspires me is not just be because of what he's accomplished, but because it, it's impossible for Wes Jackson to stay down for more than about 30 seconds. He's a, he is just a, He's constitutionally designed to be happy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, can, I can spiral down a, a bit quicker and more easily than Wes. So I, I, I like being around Wes because even with all he knows about the crisis, and, and he's known these things for 50 years. It was back in the late 1960s, he started planning for a downpowering world. Yet he, you know, I've used this term two or three times now, and it's an important one. He, he has a joyful orientation to the world. Another person I'm inspired by is another friend of mine from Kansas, Stan Cox, uh, who also works at the Land Institute. Stan is a plant breeder by training, but he's also a fellow left political activist. And he's written two or three books um, 
that I would highly recommend was one was a book on rationing called Any Way You Slice It. Uh, and then he's written two books more recently about this, this need to down power. Um, and, and you can find Stan's work online. Uh, he's inspiring. He's a, if you met him, he's the most modest, quiet, humble person. In other words, he's exactly the opposite of me. Uh, he's a brilliant scientist. You know, he's, he's one of the world's leading expert on wheat and sorghum. <laughs> and yet he pursues this question of how are we going to manage a society that cannot endure in its current form. Uh, mm. And Stan's, uh, both his humility and his intellectual uh, acuity really inspire me. So I, I, I'm lucky to, to know lots of people. The other folks I would point to are the folks I've met here in New Mexico. Uh, the, I, I mentioned this Asakia system. It's, a, it's a, an irrigation system fed by the rivers into irrigation ditches. And it's a communally run system. And in irrigation season, which is going to start up in a few weeks, a uh, couple times a week, uh, your section of the ditch shows up to, to talk about allocating water. And I've got to meet all these local folks. Uh, some of them have lived here their whole lives. Some are fairly new. Uh, and their commitment to maintaining this communally you know, run system, which nobody gets paid for except, you know, one person, um, their collective work on it, and the, the good spirit when we come together in those meetings. Uh, you know, water is precious, and it's easy to imagine people getting together and fighting, but we don't. We get together, and we laugh, and we joke, and we realize that we're not going to get water every time, that there's a priority list. And, you know, and Juan down the road has cattle and he gets water before I do, you know, and but it's a great, it, you know, I guess I'm using the word inspiring in somewhat different ways, but um, that's what keeps me going. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, there were so many things I highlighted in your book, and there was one sentence in particular that I find myself going back to almost on a weekly basis. And the quote is, Anything that blocks us from looking honestly at reality, no matter how harsh the reality, must be rejected. Yeah. And that I know that's a very deep and heavy statement, but it is so true. It is so true. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, you never know when the emotion is going to hit you upside the head. <laughs> the minute you said that and you said it with that sense of conviction, I wanted to start crying. Uh, and I'm not, a, you know, I'm from North Dakota. We don't, we don't cry in North Dakota, of course. <laughs> we just, in, we endure blizzards without uh, emotion. But no, uh, you know, there, it is, I think it is heavy because it's, it's not only so easy to avoid those harsh realities, right? Because there's distractions all around us there are perfectly human reasons to want to avoid them <laughs> mm -hmm. because they weigh on us. Right. But, you know, yeah. I think it is, it is important to develop that capacity. Let me give you the example. I think is probably most uh, forward in my mind right now. Uh, and it's the current mania among environmentalists for electric vehicles. Okay. Now right. I got nothing against electric vehicles. Don't get me wrong. Uh, would I like to see electric vehicles replace engines that run on petroleum? Absolutely. But there's a kind of denial in the electric vehicle movement of what really has to happen. What has to happen is that not just that we replace gas burning engines with electric vehicles. What has to happen is there are a lot fewer cars in the world and we drive a lot less, right? That this goes back to that notion of limits. The solution to the, the transportation problem in a car dependent culture like the United States is not electric vehicles. The solution is limits on how much we move. Right? Now, public trans improved public transportation would be a great benefit, not only you know, to the, the environmental degradation that cars create, but also just to our lives. I mean, I, I've lived in places with subway systems and, you know, subway systems are a lot better than cars. 
uh, for individuals and for the society and for the ecosystems. But the fact is, uh, in a very short amount of time, human beings, at least in the most affluent parts of the world, have gotten very used to being able to travel pretty much anytime we want to, as long as we can afford to, right? That's not only cars, that's air travel as well. Most, uh, you know, you and I, Tony, are old enough to remember when air travel was unusual, and now it's mm -hmm. routine for anybody with the income to buy a ticket. All that's going to change, right? And that's a kind of harsh reality. It's a lot easier to think, well, if we just flipped over to electric vehicles, we could continue our current way of living without interruption. But that's not possible. Electric vehicles have environmental consequences from the mining, the processing. Uh, there are social consequences to the people who end up being uh, exploited in that mining and processing. Um, and so, you know, that's one of those hard truths we have to tell. You can't get in the car every time you want to. The future of human activity is going to be staying put more than it is going to be mobile as we've become used to. Uh, and that's not just, you know, rich people can't fly to Europe whenever they want to. That also means that if you have family who live on the other side of the country, you might not get to visit. It's going to be funerals you miss. It's going to be weddings you don't get to go to because mm -hmm. people you love are too far away. It's easy to point to the worst abuses like Elon Musk. OK, let's take Elon Musk. I pause for people to chuckle. <laughs> I, it's easy to point to Elon Musk and say, you know, the Elon Musks of the world, the billionaires can't continue. But if we're going to live in a sustainable relationship to the larger living world, it's going to mean changes, not just for the billionaires and the millionaires. It's going to mean changes for everybody, including, you know, somebody like me, who's, you know, standard middle class professional. Uh, a lot of what I took for granted most of my life is not going to be available anymore. And that's a hard thing to think about. Right, right. Um, I really want to thank you for sharing some time with us. Um, it looks like we're going to look for opportunities to share this talk and conversation, yeah. as I mentioned earlier, yeah. with different individuals and in environmental climate groups, not only in Duluth, but other parts of the country. Yeah. And I look forward to staying in touch. Great. Let, let me, if I may end uh, with... Uh, a discussion of that work Wes and I've been doing. Uh, so I've, sure. I've been I've been holding up books. This is the the first one. It's called The Restless and Relentless Mind of Wes Jackson, which is a short compilation of Wes's most important ideas. This one, An Inconvenient Apocalypse, is the the uh, most recent book. But I also wanted to highlight one more. This is a paper copy of a a conversation book between Wes and I called From the Ground Up. And uh, I want to highlight this for two reasons. One is it's a transcript with some editing of conversations Wes and I did as a podcast called uh, Podcasts from the Prairie. And that's still available online. And if you want to get a flavor for Wes's incredible storytelling ability, it is the place to go. Um, it's basically me interviewing Wes over several hours, uh, but it's, in, it's a delightful project. So podcast from the Prairie is available online for free. And then this book uh, uh, from the ground up is also available online for free through a project that a friend of ours named Bill Vitek has started called the New Perennials Project. So if you just go online and search for New Perennials Project, uh, it's housed at Middlebury College and there'll be a link to books. And if you go there, you'll find uh, a free copy of this book online. And the reason I wanted to highlight that to end is because, uh, you know, this is heavy stuff. And I, I said Wes has a particularly joyful way of engaging. And that really comes through in the stories he tells, the reflections he offers in this podcast and the, and the book version of it. And so if anybody's feeling down, uh, my recommendation is give Wes a listen. Uh, he'll bring a smile to your face. So thank you for that. Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks for everyone for joining us and look forward to staying in touch. Great. Thanks so much. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Will do. Thanks.